Westwood, and uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to be, a great pleasure to be introducing our speaker, Stefania Abakerly, uh, from the World Bank. Um, we'll be having, as I'll say a, a bit about some of the future lectures, just by way of introduction, uh, three weeks hence, uh, uh, our speaker will be uh, Dee Dee Fairchild Ruggles uh, from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. She'll be talking about uh, the uh, uh, landscape and water systems of Granada. Uh, and then um, in following that, our postdocs will be giving their talks and we'll conclude with the talks, uh, uh, a talk by an uh, uh, architect from Delhi, Pankaj Vir Gupta, on his research and practice. Um, which is extended, including both the Humayun's tomb complex, but also the Yamuna River Valley. Speaker tonight, Stefania Bakhti, is a senior urban development planner in uh, the South Asia region uh, in the practice group known as Culture and Inclusive Tourism Development. Uh, this is the World Bank. Stefania studied architecture, uh, urban planning, and urban design in Brazil and the UK. Prior to the bank, uh, she advised national and state governments on inner city revitalization. She had her own firm in Brazil uh, working on these types of projects. And she joined the bank, uh, as she mentioned, 17 years ago in 2002. That makes her a veteran. Uh, a survivor. And a survivor. <laughs> Uh, where she's managed a range of multi-sector investment projects. Uh, this is involved uh, in earlier uh, years post-conflict types of uh, development uh, in Africa and the Middle East, as well as South and East Asia. Uh, but her field of expertise, as it's been developing over the years, is in uh, culture, heritage conservation, and what's called inclusive tourism. Uh, and in particular in the South Asia region, which is the largest region in the bank's practice in uh, uh, heritage conservation and development. Uh, she led a World Bank UNESCO study of inclusive urban heritage revitalization uh, for Indian cities, involved pilot projects in, in a range of cities that uh, were, the project was brought to the bank by the, both by the ministries of finance and urban development. And it's very interesting to see what the different uh, origins are of these projects. Uh, this one involved publications about inclusive uh, heritage revitalization and its significance for urban economic development, um, but a very different and uh, kind of fascinating study uh, was brought by the Ministry of Water Supply and Sanitation, known as Iconic Swatch. Now, for those from uh, India will be familiar with the Swatch program and movements of the past uh, uh, years on, uh, on a kind of shifted emphasis from water supply to sanitation, and the role, importance of sanitation in cities and also rural areas. This project involved, uh, was to involve 100 of the premier heritage sites and ways in which the sanitation in their environments, if improved, the theory went, could cascade and diffuse into secondary settlements and other uh, places of significance uh, by the example of some places ranging from the Taj Mahal complex to Ajmer Sharif, um, Sufi Shrine, Tir Tirupati Temple, uh, and Chhatrapati Shivaji Railway Station in Mumbai. So you can imagine a, a diversity of heritage sites in which this common theme was being pursued. pursued. It's very interesting. Uh, currently, uh, the, the projects that she is leading include an international Buddhist circuit heritage program in, across several countries in South Asia, uh, within India, interstate Buddhist Heritage uh, Circuit, uh, but then also a $40 million uh, project or program in the Uttar Pradesh tourism development uh, domain that's involving multiple projects for urban improvement in the vicinity of Agra, uh, where everything from sanitation to housing to infrastructure 
are to be addressed in integrated ways and in a uh, in exceptional heritage context. Stefania serves as a member or advisor in organizations that range from the European Cultural Diplomacy Platform uh, to a foundation, the Santagata Foundation on the Economics of Culture, where she has lectured on themes such as investing in cultural heritage to enhance physical and social resilience. The talk with us tonight is titled, Why Culture Matters for Urban Development in India. We're thrilled to have you here. Welcome. Thank you. It's an honor for me to be here. And Jim, we worked together in this watch, but uh, we were discussing that under this, you, for those of you in, from India, you know about the Swatch Bara, the Clean India Initiative. As you know, in the SDGs, there is a target of 200 million toilets. Most of it, most of this is needed in India. So it's a huge program that came straight from the Prime Minister. And Modi himself, himself from India, he came with this idea of the signature uh, program called uh, Iconic Places, targeting the 100 most iconic places in India, as Jim said. And initially, this was done, it was supposed to be done by the Ministry of Water and Sanitation. And they knew that they didn't have the expertise, not the different land to work or something like that. The secretary at that time, he had worked in the bank, he is a sanitation engineer. He knew about, he thought, okay, here is an institution that can work on it. And they put the challenge on us. We had to do, we had one year to get everything done. And everything means action plans, bringing the municipalities with the head of every single site or the trust, if it's a temple, bring them together and come up with a plan to clean. But I mean, initially they thought about cleaning for them was literally sweeping the streets. And then, you know, Jim came. We had to do something so quickly, you needed to have a remarkable team. Mm -hmm. So Jim accepted to come and work with us, and he set the whole tone, showed to the government the meaning of cleanliness in Hindi and all the, all the traditional ancient languages. And this open space, and we, we did everything from literally cleaning to do urban renewal, to do all kinds of things, and re rehabilitation of the cities thinking about cleanliness very deeply. And the beauty about this program is that we got, for the first ever, we got the government, the local government, sitting together with the spiritual leader. And it was the most remarkable thing we ever did. Because the government, we said, OK, you put the beans. And then we look at the spiritual leader and said, no, you tell people to use the beans, right? And stop spitting and create all this and use your traditions and etc. And it was remarkable. And we did. We had a plan three, six, nine, twelve months with target activities and it has been done. If you go there, I was telling Jimmy, go to a place like the Golden Temple and others, it's remarkable to see when you bring this too, when you bring the best of the administration with all these cultural traditions and use them, especially because this development is not only about providing the service, there is a huge amount of behavioral change in the social compact, and we use the culture to motivate and stimulate it. So, Jim, I'm very thankful to you for that, who brought a big smile to everybody and helped us with that. So regarding this, when we were discussing about what could I share with you today? There are, there are many, many, many projects. But we thought about more than projects, because I know that so many of you work in your own projects and have been leading so much um, around the world. We thought, rather than showing one more project, we thought, why not to show the whole bank trajectory into that? I know there is a lot of there are lots of people who think, oh, World Bank, World Bank, you know? And it's hard to connect the cultural dimension in such, from such a multilateral, the largest one, multilateral agency in the world. There is so much bad news about everything the bank does. But I thought, why not to show the other side? There is something quite remarkable, the trajectory, how it has evolved, how we have from the development perspective, embrace the cultural agenda, and 
within that in practi more practical terms, rather than showing one example here, then to show the program we have in South Asia. And the reason for South Asia is not because I'm in charge of it, but more important because this is very new. This is the mission despite the countless, the, it's, there's no way of defining what they have, what is there in South Asia in terms of assets. Yet, within the bank, it was an untouched charge. You know, we have very little done. It's the region we have done the least so far on cultural and heritage. There is a project in Pakistan, here and there, but nothing very comprehensive, very deeply embedded in our work. So how we have broken the ceiling? How have we started this? And also, interesting enough, to do this, we end up by changing a lot. And Many people today in the bank say that this is the latest in terms of thinking and doing what we are trying to do. So that's to offer you, to share with you, and to hear from you any ideas how to move forward on this. So I start, since we are talking about Jassane, with the, uh, about South Asia, with Amar Jassane, culture is a means and an end to develop. And many people, they always ask, how do you position culture? Is how, why a development organization work on culture? Is it a means? We say, no, this is absolutely everything. And how this comes about? Basically, the debate really starts in the 90s. We had a series of these structural adjustments. You may remember that. And a series of very deep failed policies. We really did very bad. And I mean we is the entire development community. At a time where we were trying to impose things and the policies, they were not working. We were very, very much focused on growth and on sharing, on the trickle-down effect. We were saying, okay, you grow the pie, you share the pie, everybody's going to be rich and everybody's going to be happy. That's not reality. We really deeply fail. And at that time, it's what you show here, People like Amartya Sen and others, they started discussing about the multidimensional aspects of poverty. Saying it's not only about money, it's not only about income, it's not only about material. There is a multitude of uh, aspects that make someone poor. Like for instance, circumstances, where you are born, which family, etc., etc. So at that time, this it starts shaping completely in a completely different way the whole debate and the practice of development. And it was within this debate that culture was brought in very, very central in the policies, especially of the bilaterals, it starts with the Scandinavian. And organizations like ours to what we call the time the comprehensive development framework that used to give us the guide and our vision how we, we work forward. We articulated why an institution like the bank, what are the motivation. We saw what we call the multiplier effects and impacts of culture in, from various dimensions, from social, from environmental, and of course from economic viewpoint, which is a range of uh, uh, potential impacts. But this is, I'm talking about the 90s, right? That's when the agenda becomes absolutely, deep, becomes deeply ingrained in the, the institution. But before that, there is a big before. I don't know if you know, our very first loan was given to France in, in 1947. It was a $250 uh, million dollars that was given to France right after the war. And in that law, uh, believe it or not, if you look at the archives, it's remarkable. The economists, they recognize that the importance of culture. And through that law, we invest in cities, landmarks, and other aspects in for the reconstruction of France. So of course, the request came from the government, say, we don't want only for you to, because we were supposed to give them financing for large infrastructure. said, but we don't want to build any road. We want you to build a French road. And I think it has to do with what you were your class today, you know, value of the French way. So that was a very 
important uh, lesson for the bank. And here is how we got into when we, when we entered there. And just as a measure of comparison that we use to talk to other governments, if you look at France today, this is the first tourist destination in the world. I'm not saying that the World Bank is responsible for that. What I'm saying is the government had a very important vision to understand, okay, I'm going to rebuild my country using the best of its cultural roots as the basis for that. And they were able to articulate this vision and engage with partners like us, because they engage with many, many, and demand this and make sure that this is done. And this is the result. That's what, we, for instance, when we go across the world, and there's so many countries that are going through very severe process of conflicts, etc. These are the kind of stories we share with them and say, look, don't neglect, even in the moment of urgency, when you do need to have the water and everything, don't forget, in the future, don't forget about your culture. It's going to lead you to something very positive. So in the 50s, we did that. For a long time, we were a little bit, this happened and the institution was dominated, largely dominated by economists. After that, the bank changed. We stopped financing, um, as you know, um, Europe, etc. We changed to finance what's so-called the developing world. <coughs> Not much action. Then in the 70s, there is, this is what I call the dark times. <laughs> it was very bad. We had a high, it's like if everything we learned in the 50s we had forgotten. And at this time we had highly dominated by the economists, I'm sorry to say, and by very much people thinking about so the private sector, only the economics, when we were focusing very deeply on the economics. And here is when we financed the resorts across Caribbean, etc., which were very, very bad. And that's why I don't have any picture because everything is so bad, it's better not to share. <laughs> and, but I show this because it's very important. We learn a lot. Learning, the mistakes are so fundamental. Unfortunately, we make mistakes, but we can learn from them. Better is to learn from them than make it again. So we learn from that. And learning from this very dark, very bad time, we start articulating. And then in the 90s, that's what I'm saying, in the 90s we had the foundation of something very special we have done, something not <coughs> special at all we have done. And in the center of all this debate on the multidimensional aspects and the center of poverty, we were able to articulate, based on the experience, very good and very bad, the, what we call a very happy, a very, um, a very important moment in his work on culture and development, when we focus so fundamentally on this notion of cultural identity. And here is when, for instance, you all know about what happened here. This is one of the projects I am most proud of when I think about things the World Bank has done. It was a very, very, very small project. We, right after the, the war, the bank has came up with a huge package, more than a billion dollars, to reconstruct again the country. And this was like eight, nine, ten million dollars, just a small penny out of this big, big package. But it was this work that really brought the, the whole country back together. And here, in this one beautiful part of this project, that we did three things on it. We helped in the reconstruction of the bridge, and we were one among manners, many. UNESCO was leading the design. There are so many, many players there. And we were helping on the articulation of everybody and, and the financing. We help with the development of all these new economic activities in this area. And a very a third thing we did, which was, I think, the most precious of all, we went to the three communities that were fighting against each other. And we said, you choose something that's important for you. 
this is more important for all of you. This is bridging you back. But before that, we went to each of them and said, you choose something that's important for you, and we'll finance it, no matter what you ask, a tree, a uh, church, whatever you want. And they came, they did, and so we did this too. We did work which was at community level, with the economic surroundings, and the symbolic region of the city, which uh, end up by symbolize the region of the country. This is a very beautiful project that came at that time as well. We started, we continue evolving, and again, then on a spiral up, when we start looking that even more in terms of sustainability. And these are two absolutely beautiful examples. One is in Honduras. This is where Copan is, which is one of, um, the department of Copan is one of the poorest um, regions of the country, but they also have Copan, which is one of the most magnificent archaeological sites associated with the Mayas, and it's the only one which has color. And Copan itself, the park, sustained the entire network of parks of the entire Honduras, which is in Central America. It's a very tiny country, but remarkable in terms of what they have, but very poor. And all these, these peoples are the farmers, the campesinos, they are here in front of the park. So what used to happen is that they used to strike in front of the park, so no, the visitors couldn't come, and this was a, break, a huge breakdown in the economy, because if you can't go to Copan, you can't get the ticket, the government breaks, because this is the main source of revenue. So what we did in this, and that's why in social inclusion, we focus exclusively on the people. We said, why is this happening? So we provide them with all kind of possibilities like this. this. They are part of some of the families. We group girls. We produce things. That, and then we link them to the hotels. We did fundamental work on creating this economic, this value chain, and what we call the social inclusion, using culture and development as the basis for that. It's a beautiful project. The other one is Georgia, that moved from communities looking at cities. The cities, they had an enormous, there was this huge um, economic shock in the 2000s. So we focused, rather than the small communities and people, we focused on the cities. We create, we help to establishing firms and revitalizing the city. So we moved from this small community to the neighborhood and city level, but it's the same. So these are two very special examples from the 90s and early 2000s. Until today, and this is the, what I'm going to elaborate, what we call, all of this has evolved from um, what we call a multi-sectorial and a spatial <coughs> focus program. So it's not anymore about inclusion and this is that. It's really, you go, you have a place, and how you connect every single dimension within that specific place and work on it. India is at the forefront, it's the most advanced um, location where we are um, working. As it says here, we, that's what I'm going to share with you. There is not one single player. We are engaged from every single angle. Everything is, you know, scratch at the door that we see, we enter. Everything is not only the Ministry of Culture or Urban Development. We are working with sanitation. We are working with energy. We work with the environment. We work with everybody because culture is, is an element of effectiveness for every single sector and is so cross-cutting, and is using, actually, we can weave together so many of these dimensions. We also work with many partners, as I showed you. This is, let me talk about the program. What is the motivation? The motivation is what they have. I remember one day I was, I was with Francesco Bandarin, who was the, Director General of Cultural Tunis, and I asked him, what is it? Tell me about one place in the world where it is, it's just remarkable what they have. And he said, it's India, but there is so little down there. 
there in terms of development of associated with children. You know? It's what they have. It's just it starts with 1.8 billion people in this entire region and the enormous assets, the languages, the craftsmanship, everything that these people carries with them. And then there is nature and the landscapes and you have like this, you know, the Himalaya which provides fresh water for one third of humanity. You have things which are, you can't even imagine, they are so remarkable. And more than anything, <coughs> you have what we call the people-to-people vibrancy. -people we associate a lot of South Asia. When we look at South Asia, we always think this is the least connected region in the world. If you look in terms of infrastructure, in terms of trade, from a political economy, it's, an it's a very complicated, extremely complex region. But when you go down, take out of this cloud and go down to people, the movement, the dynamism, the vibrancy is, you just can't measure it. It's absolutely remarkable what's happening in that part of the world. There are things like this. And then we trickle down and you look at, for instance, how culture, if you associate with tourism, you know, Nepal is the first foreign exchange revenue earner, Bhutan is the second after hydropower in India. You saw that now 90% of the population is remarkable. But as anything in the world, there are issues. And what I have learned that the major issue is that culture in the context of South Asia, and I have to say in the context of so many places, is not, as it's mentioned there, is not really understood, well positioned, and not structured as a development plan. We talk about everything, <coughs> about all this, but it's completely disassociated. It's like if there are two pillars and a big wall, and people say, oh, culture, good for leisure, all the dead, but they can't associate, they don't associate. Even what, if I go back to a market saying, always you are saying that culture, the cultural assets sometimes are the only possession that the poor has. And even in the bank, sometimes I have my top chief economists talking about very elaborate, and then I show them, I have a beautiful book with all these remarkable crafts that are made in this part of the world. And I show them, I look and say, can you make it? You, with your amazing PhDs in economics, can you make this? And they look at me. And I, then I show the next page of the woman sitting on the floor without shoes, without half of the teeth, dressed very badly, and making something with her hands that I can't make and I don't think any of us in this world can make. And this is something that she has, this is an asset, that is not valued as a development of energy. So that's, it's not well articulated. And how do we know it? We see it everywhere. For instance, in cities, that's what we, that's how I start working in India. My first program was the Ministry of Finance. They have established, they have given $50 billion to the Ministry of Urban Development to establish the largest urban development program in the world, $50 billion. When we start work with JNURM, when we start working there, the program was at the end, and the Ministry of Finance figured out that about 60% of the money had not been allocated, and whatever had been allocated had been allocated very badly. And they had systematically designated cities as slums, because of the infrastructure, because of the way that people used to live. This is, this is Agra. This is Agra, and this is in Jaipur. This is the entry entry for a protected monument, because of the way the cities were. So the Minister of Finance was so upset with the Minister of Urban Development, and then they called the bank and said, can you come up with a suggestion of that? And this was one of the programs we did was, we said, okay, we can think about a different approach to 
it was an urban renewal program, and he said, let's think about a different approach to digitalization. Yeah. Starting with the understanding of the culture as an asset for development, not a liability. Because interesting enough, despite the fact that they have this, they all think about, okay, preserving this. We have to preserve culture. And I, I keep saying to them, you don't preserve culture. Culture preserves by itself. You have to support it. You have to support the system, the custodians, and etc. And then the process goes by itself. This is, for instance, another example. Why am I showing the Taj Mahal? We are working there. This is right behind the Taj Mahal. This is what the government sells to the world. <coughs> this is where we work. <laughs> I don't go there, we go here. This is right behind the Taj Mahal. I, I look at these things and I tell the government, you explain to me the 21st century legacy, because this is what has been given to us and this is what we are producing today with all the technology and $50 billion. What is it? You know, it's a failure of approach. It's a failure of the way of going about things. Same in rural areas. So it's not only in cities, but in rural areas. What we have been seeing is that either the rural areas are packed as exotic tourism, Let's look at this exotic village and let's preserve this village. Don't let, no, no, they can't have toilets. They have to do this and they have to be kept like this because I, as a tourist, I want to visit and I want to make sure that it's just like in the 11th century. And, but I go back to my com the comfort of my hotel, but these guys have to be like this. Either it's like this or you have an urban expansion happening without any type of planning, no matter how many urban planners are out there. There is no influence. There is nothing happening. The engineers are completely, all the local governments. I was working, when we were working in this program, I had a discussion with the Minister of Finance, and he told me, what's the problem? I said, sir, with all my due respect, the people who sit in Delhi, they are not sitting in the 5,000 municipalities we have worked. And when you go to these 5,000 municipalities, normally you have three people in the municipality, of which you will, one is a junior engineer, that's it. I'm dealing with a junior engineer. This is the entire municipality. So how do I do about it? There are none of us there. There are no heritage, no sociologists, no nothing. These are the people you are dealing with. And there's one junior engineer who has to do the entire work. And that's what happens. There's no planning or anything. And with this, the traditions are dying. The cities, the small villages are being abandoned. Very, very, very. So how we go about that? So with all of this, we put this program together. We work using a language that was, and that's something very important, a language that was digested by the development community. That's why I use the word inclusive growth. And this is also a language, don't forget, like in, in my case, in the case of the World Bank, we don't work with individuals, we work with governments. No? My main counterpart is also the Minister of Finance, and then through the Minister of Finance, they have a big plan, and then we articulate with the sectorial ministries. But just to keep into perspective, so that's why we keep things in this level. But when I say inclusive growth is a language that the development community allow me to come in, I can start in the dialogue, let's say, through a cultural asset-based approach to development. And that's a very important dimension, because going back to what we are saying, Culture in the mind of most of the development people is a liability. Oh, it's a museum. Oh, it's this. Everything, now with the disasters, there is a disaster. There was this earthquake in Nepal, and we were doing this huge program on housing. And I was begging my DRM colleagues and say, come on, put just one word there, that the houses, they have to be culturally sensitive to the Mevas and to the traditional cultures. Huge loss of opportunity. They said, no, 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 it's going to be more costly. I said, why? They are going to use the local materials. You're going to generate local employment. I try everything. But they said, no, no, we have no time. We have to rush. We have three weeks to deliver the program. We have a long way to go, friends. 
really help. But anyway, but change, trying to change and say, look, I'm not talking about culture here for tourists to come and see. I'm talking here about the basis you know, of what is in there. Rather than going and destroying everything and dumping everything in a landfill, let's rebuild. And that's why we started to meet. And one thing we need is a lot of evidence. We needed to do research. We needed to do showing. You know, for instance, there is a colleague here in the U.S. He does a lot of research showing the price, how much it costs doing new construction versus rehabilitating. And there are some remarkable numbers. But these are U.S. And some people say, oh, but this is the U.S. How is it in Lebanon, in India, etc.? So we need this kind of research and evidence to continue helping us to push for this. But anyway, we try. Our goals are, again, language that are, can be digested with development, support inclusive organization, uh, organization, and look at what we call alternative sources. And that's also a language that works very well, because there is still this thing, oh my god, there is this huge crisis of employment for the youth across the world. And then we take the development and say, yeah, yeah, because what you're saying is not working. We need something different. They say, OK, go and try. And that's the whole basis why we agreed to do this thing with the Let me try something different, and I'll tell you about it. So how we go about? <coughs> we're working at four levels. And that's something also important that I would like to share, and that's something very special about this program. For instance, in China, we have been working for more than 20 years. But the entire program we have in China is long, is lengthy. We start with urban environmental projects, start with sanitation, adding a small component in these projects, which is great, until today where we have you know, self-standing <coughs> cultural heritage programs affecting entire cities, which is great. But it's only the domes, it's lengthy. In our case, we said, no, no, no. We have to work in all dimensions. It's very important. Because it's important to have projects, but we have to address also the systemic problems. Systemic problems at policy level, for instance, in Bhutan, I'm working. One of the issues we found out is why people are demolishing traditional houses in Bhutan. Because the banks, because the houses are made mostly of wood and they are earth based and wood, the bank doesn't want to insure. There is no insurance. They charge 50% more if you have a traditional house. And people say, I don't have this money. So they knock down the house and build in concrete, because then they get insurance from the bank. And we found out doing an analysis, because they are the Bhutanese government, they are preparing the cultural heritage bill, first of its time. We have been advising them and looking and saying, where in the system? Where we are stuck in the system? So that's why the policy is so important looking at, as I mentioned, the local governance, how cities are planned and managed, and the local governance is so fundamental because it's right there. Looking at how infrastructure and services are provided, and of course, the local economic dimension. So working all of them together. How? So how do we make this happen? We are working at, in terms of spatially, we have said, OK, let's uh, work on historic cities, traditional villas, and cultural landscapes. And here are the kind of argumentations I was mentioning to you, the economics that are so fundamental and allow us to enter, no? Like this, new construction generates 326 jobs, rehabilitation 35.4. There is also a lot of other data talking about the new construction is immediate jobs, these are more permanent jobs, and etc. Et this is another fascinating um, data we have on rentals. The other one is working on the culture and well, co-creative industries. Is not only the major, perhaps, but the most important economic driver today especially in the developed countries. If you look at Europe, this is what is the least in Europe today in the crisis. There are huge no economic impacts. And then, of course, looking at the tourism, which 
is the most visible, the most obvious one, and that's why I bring it at the very end. But it's a very important um, 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 entry point for us. So what we have done is we have created three sub-programs that we are working. One, this is for instance in Bhutan, that we are working with these traditional villages. Most of these villages, there are about 5,000 of them, most of these villages are being completely abandoned today because what's happening is the government has rightly so invested in education. So the youth today is highly educated, but they create, they, they come up and educate the youth using a curriculum that is not equivalent to what the country can absorb. Like there are three years back, the amount of IT people in Bhutan where you don't have connectivity. And so these, guys, these kids are on, on the streets. They don't have a job. So they come up with that. That's what I'm saying about the linking culture and everything. It was a culturally sensitive curriculum. You would do for, a, for, for that context to be able to absorb. Why did in IT? Because everybody in the world was talking about the IT revolution. Anyway. So what's happening is you have very old people now here with the small little kids and the youth, the 25 years old, they are all in Tinku in the capital. Of the 700,000 people, Tinku, the capital has 100,000 people living there. So there is a major problem happening because most of the employment happens in the rural area. 70% of the land in Bhutan is forest, declares national. Is a reservation. All this forest is managed by this community. So at the moment that this community breaks down because of the failure in the education and the employment system, everything you see is disconnected, it's fragmented, it's compartmentalized. All this around, all of this is falling apart. So what we are doing, we are helping here, in this case, the Minister of Culture and the Minister of Urban Development now with the Minister of Forest as well, and others to come up. We help them in establishing this cultural heritage bill. And we are helping them to create, to bring back the youth and create employment back at the doorsteps of their houses. Another <coughs> important thing is in Bhutan, the women, they own land, which is unique in South Asia and in most parts of the world. Which means everybody says, wow, they have owned the land, it's amazing. But this means that they don't have economic mobility. They are educated with their brothers, their brothers move on, they have to come back to their villages. So in spite of being educated, they have no they can't go anywhere. So they said, why don't we shift rather than leaving everything here and created this artificial curriculum? Why don't we think about things that the village can be their village? So we are working. This program is being championed by the Queen itself, itself herself. It's a beautiful program we are working. And we are working on the historic cities. As I mentioned before, we were helping the Ministry of Urban Development and the Ministry of Finance. We test a new approach for urban revitalization that was fully adopted by the government and we established three day. Sorry for my Hindu. But for those of you from India, <laughs> you can say it better, but it means so. And this is the first heritage-based city development program. It's the first scheme that was launched. They launched this in 2015, and they just completed this year. So we have worked for seven years with the ministry, helping to test an approach of urban revitalization, helping the design of the program, implementation, and closing. So I just, just closed this. It was a wonderful experience of how look at culture not as something beautiful for you to put in your shelf or for you to visit, but culture as the basis of your development. For instance, we were working in Varanasi, and it's very interesting when we start working there, which is the most sacred city for any Hindu, and our colleagues from India can explain why. But when we started working, they said, oh, let's work in the riverfront because it's so iconic, so emblematic. I said, no, no, I don't care about this riverfront. I, work to, I want to work in the water, in the coons, 
which have been built in the past as part of an entire system of water management, flood control, water management, and, and we start working. And we took even the district magistrate together for the first time to see places was remarkable, but showing, look, look you used to have 158 Kunz uh, water bodies in the city, now there are 28. All the other ones have disappeared because of lack of planning, encroachment, throwing stuff, they are the land field today. We said, if we can re 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 revitalize this, we can take care of so many problems you have today in the city, like flooding, water, etc. So that's the perspective we have, and that's what we have been able to talk, just show the government. So it's basically doing this and say, wow, we have this. And say, yeah, India, for instance, is the home of the modern, uh, when you think about smart cities and centers, this is in the Hindu um, civilization that come up with remarkable concepts in terms of urbanization that we are trying to apply today. So let's go back to that. The second program is on the border circuit. This is regional level. And this program, we are focused more on nature and women. One thing we are saying here is, because if you look at the history, that's a, that's a lot of political economy. When we start thinking about the program of using culture in the region, again, this is a very dense, complicated region. So we put together all the ministries of tourism and culture and said, what would be one, one thing that you all can talk without fighting? <laughs> what is one thing that we can have a pleasant, dinner together, and everybody's going home together, happy. And they were putting their minds, and they said they put this in, because they said, but we got the association of the Buddhists more with the philosophy rather than a yeah? So then, based on their feedback, they said, can you help us? So we start, we put together this program where we are working on these places, and one of the most beautiful things is that what we are trying here to do is a very deep environmental program because if you look at the entire, the main events related to the Buddha, everything happened under the tree. You know? Where he was born, where he got enlightened, where he shared his first sermon, the Buddha guy, etc. Everything has to do with the tree. So we are raising, bringing back, back this notion of rescuing the sanctity of these places. And this entails a lot of work, especially with the women, because of the way they are. And also, we are here going back to the notions of to some numbers, for instance, in terms of tourism that say globally it's 50% of women leading on the tourism industries, etc. So we are saying in the case of the Buddhist service, it's less than 1%. So we are bringing a very strong gender dimension and an environmental dimension here, which are the entry points for this. While in the heritage cities, we are looking at a lot of living conditions and employment. And the third one is pure policies. We have this very heavy component where we provide pure advisory support, going straight looking at policies and programs and everything that these countries have, and bringing them together to think and to erase and redo and find out, as it says here, what are uh, the binding constraints and how can we eliminate. For instance, if you need a license to operate in you know, this country, I have a beautiful picture of how if you needed to build a small hotel anywhere in India, you need like 75 licenses. That takes you five years, and I don't know everything in between you can imagine. So how you can make things more easier, no? So, and that's how we have gone. I was, I was doing this map the other day. So we start with a small technical assistance to the Minister of Urban Development, the one that Jim was talking, testing this new approach for urban revitalization in these four cities. From here, we got, because one of the cities was Varanasi in the state of Uttar Pradesh. And based on this work we have done, the state government came to us and said, look, this is too little, we want more for you. We want an entire project. So then we came 
and prepared an entire project looking at Agra, Braj, the Buddha, everything you can imagine that state was amazing. And we are implementing it. And from there, we came up from working from in four cities, we were able to, put to help the government to put together a scheme that scale up from four cities to ten states. So the work we have done, the test, this small testing of the approach now is being done in ten states. And from here, we have done in other states, we kept working, engaging the policies. This is the Buddha circuit. Working with the environmental team, that's another very interesting thing. As we went about doing this work, other teams, they start looking and say, hey, we can do this in our project. There is this beautiful program, it's the Ganga program, which is a billion dollar lending from the bank. And the environmental team responsible looking at water quality, all this kind of stuff, they said, hey, can you help us here? Because we are not getting where we want to get. So we cut $100 million we took from them, and we, start, we did some river from development uh, projects out of the river from, uh, throughout the Ganga. That's something very interesting. And then, we get, this is the iconic sites that Jim was mentioning in the beginning. They just start popping up across the map, and we continue. Yeah. But we need help. We need a lot of help to continue. I was still telling Jim, we needed to find a way and this is my thing to all of you, to linking professionals like you with the governments that I work with. For me today, for instance, one of the main things we are failing, for instance, on the urban side, is on the imagination. They have, it's so big, the problems they have to address. They don't have the expertise, they don't have the time, they don't have the patience. So we needed to find a way, and I'm here to ask you how to, to link remarkable professions like you to all these governments back. I still don't know how, because in my case, I give all the money to the government, the government has to hire you. I don't know how they can find me, but that's something that we need. I would love to discuss with all of you, how can we break this barrier and really make sure that can bring the best of both worlds together. And that's where I start.